Hey, what is up guys? Welcome back to chapter 8. We have now completed the first section of this entire video series by learning the fundamentals of solar cells. Now we are going to progress into the more advanced portion of this video series. Up until now, we have been learning about the traditional wafer-type crystalline silicon solar cells, which is relatively thick, about a few hundred microns thick. These are called the first generation solar cells. In this video, we will be introducing thin film solar cells, or what we call the second generation solar cells. Thin film solar cells are about a few microns thin, which is about a hundred times thinner than a traditional wafer type solar cell. Because these solar cells are much thinner, the manufacturing methods differ, the physics differ. So in this video, we will be covering the key basic differences that make thin film solar cells unique. So, the first question that most people will ask is, why make it thinner? Why the extra effort? Well, the main reason behind the use of thin film solar cells is its cost advantage. Although they are lower in efficiency, making a solar cell thin will generally reduce the amount of material used. Therefore, in certain cases, the cost per watt of a thin film solar cell may be even lower than traditional crystalline ones. Looks like it's all about the money after all. So sorry, Jesse J. Because they are thin, they are extremely lightweight and can also be flexible. This opens up an opportunity for building integrated photovoltaics, or BIPV in short. BIPV is the installation of solar cells onto building facades to harness light. This means gone are the days of only being able to install big, bulky solar panels onto rooftops. This increases the surface area installable with solar cells so that we can harness more sunlight and also increases the aesthetic appeal of the building. Now, there are three well-known types of thin film solar cells out there. They are amorphous silicon, copper indium gallium selenide, CIGS and cadmium telluride, CDTE. One thing that these materials have in common is its higher absorption coefficient compared to crystalline silicon solar cells. The absorption coefficient is basically the degree of light absorption per unit thickness. For crystalline silicon cells, due to its lower absorption coefficient, we need a larger thickness to absorb the same amount of sunlight. But for the case of thin film, because of its higher absorption coefficient, they require much lesser thickness to absorb that same amount of sunlight. Remember, absorption coefficient varies with the photon energy that is absorbed. This graph shows the absorption coefficient of three different thin film solar cells at various photon energies compared to crystalline silicon. We can see that generally, these solar cells have a greater absorption coefficient than crystalline silicon. Now, let us explore the structure of a typical thin film solar cell. For the purpose of this video, we will use cadmium telluride as an example as they are the ones that are being the most commercialized out of the three. Imagine this is where sunlight comes in. The glass is a mandatory superstrate for subsequent layers to be deposited onto. Like crystalline silicon, cadmium telluride is still based on a PN junction. The main PN junction of cadmium telluride comes from an N-type cadmium sulfide and a P-type cadmium telluride. The much thicker P layer is the main absorbing layer, whereas the much thinner N layer acts like an emitter. This is pretty similar to crystalline silicon cells. However, the difference is that in cadmium telluride solar cells, the P and N layer are technically two different materials. We call this a heterojunction. 
Now, let us plot the energy band diagram for this hetero junction. As I mentioned in chapter three point zero, we always start energy band diagrams with the Fermi level. Then we go ahead to plot the conduction and valence bands of cadmium sulfide and cadmium telluride. Don't worry about the bands bending for now. One thing to note is that these two materials have lots and lots of grain boundaries due to their polycrystalline nature. These grain boundaries are full of defects, which serves as traps for minority carrier recombination, reducing both the open circuit voltage and short circuit current. We call this defect-assisted recombination. This is why the lifetime of minority carriers and thin film cells are extremely short compared to crystalline silicon. Next, we have the electron and hole transport layers. We will discuss the function of electron and hole transport layers and why their energy bands are plotted this way shortly. Finally, we have the anode and cathode. The anode is different from crystalline silicon cells because it is made of a transparent conductive oxide to allow light to pass through and be conductive at the same time. Remember, in crystalline silicon, we instead use opaque metal grids as the anode. The anode and cathode are conductors, which means they have overlapping conduction and valence bands. Hence, it only makes sense to label the Fermi energy levels. Now, this forms the full structure of the entire cadmium telluride cell. The working principle of cadmium telluride solar cells is pretty similar to crystalline silicon. When we connect a load and shine light onto the solar cell, electron gets excited, travels to the hetero junction, where the electric field sweeps the electron into the N layer. Electron travels to the anode through the external circuit comes back to the cathode and recombines with the hole. The band diagram that we see so far is highly simplified. In reality, it looks something like this. The bands in the p-type absorber layer actually bend due to the influence of the electric field in the depletion region. The solar cell is so thin that the depletion region can sometimes cover the entire thickness of the p-layer up until the whole transport layer. When an electron is excited, there are three possibilities where the electron might end up going to. One, and hopefully, the electron travels down the energy band to the junction where it will get separated. Two, the electron recombines via a defect-assisted recombination. And three, the electron recombines through the cathode and contact, called surface recombination. Of course, we would want to maximize possibility one and minimize possibility two and three to maximize the amount of electrons that are collected at the junction since only they contribute to light-generated current. One of the ways is to introduce an electron and hole transport layer. The electron and hole transport layers prevent surface recombination of minority carriers by introducing an energy barrier to the anode and cathode. Another way that affects the fate of this electron is the degree of this energy band slope. This is controlled by the voltage that is measured across the solar cell. The higher the voltage, the lesser the slope. Lesser electrons are collected at the junction and hence lesser light generated current. We can technically increase light generated current by increasing the slope but then we sacrifice voltage. This simple trade-off is why thin film solar cells differ. Thin film solar cells have a voltage-dependent light-generated current. 
unlike crystalline silicon cells, which has a constant light-generated current, regardless of voltage. So, in summary, we discussed three important differences between thin film and traditional crystalline silicon cells. Thin film cells usually have a higher absorption coefficient. It is also full of defects, which means the minority carrier lifetime is much lower. Thin film solar cells also have a voltage-dependent light-generated current, unlike the voltage-independent characteristics of a traditional crystalline silicon cell. That's it guys for this chapter on thin film solar cells. We gave a brief overview of thin film solar cells by discussing its types, structures, and key differences to traditional wafer-type solar cells. The question of comparing thin film solar cells and wafer-type solar cells does not have a straightforward answer. It's kind of like comparing fruits and vegetables. Each has their own benefits. Now that we have covered first and second generation solar cells, in the next video, we are going to explore a third generation solar cell concept called multi-junction solar cells. Take care and goodbye.